right, good evening. Welcome back again. We were having some technical difficulties. My name is Deontay Carroll, host of Turn Up the Volume Podcast. Today is eight, uh, I said April, August the 19th, 2021. Listen, this is one of the most realest shows. You're going to see everything. Sometimes you're going to see technical difficulties, but we're trying to work out the kinks and do what we can, all right, even in this pandemic. But guess what? We're still having the time of my life, of our lives. And listen, um, we have a special guest here today. Uh, so we have the author of a new book that was just released today. This month, Mutiny of Rage, the 1917 Camp Logan Riots and Buffalo Soldiers in Houston, uh, Texas. And first, this past, I want to read this because this is very important. This past June, we commemorated the 100th um, anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre documentaries filled the airways of TV networks. Even recently, we had on our show, if you guys remember, Reverend Dr. Robert Turner, pastor of Vernon AME Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to talk all things Tulsa, specifically the Tulsa Race Massacre that took place 100 years ago. But before um, Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921, there was another massacre that took place in Houston, Texas. It was the Houston Riot of 1917, where 13, well, 13 Buffalo soldiers were brought to the gallows to be hung until dead. Wait a minute, did we lose our guess again? I think we lost them. Uh, well, 13 bu black buffalo soldiers were brought to the gallows to be hung until dead. August 23rd, 1917, an armed revolt took place in response to Houston's Jim Crow laws, and police harassment resulted in the camp's most heralded incident, the Houston Mutiny and Riot of 1917. And today we have um, to talk about the Houston riots of 1917. Hame Salazar, author of Mutiny of Rage, the 1917 Camp Riots and Buffalo Soldiers in Houston, Texas. And uh, this is his book here. Let me show y'all his book. This is his book, Mutiny of Rage, the 1917 Camp Logan Riots and Buffalo Soldiers. And with a quote from Mark Twain saying, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Very powerful thesis. Explain to us what that means. What that means. <laughs> right. It, it it essentially means that we are not going to have carbon copy historical events, but man, they sure do look alike. You know, and especially when it comes when it comes to some of the racial 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 things that you know I talk about in the book. You, you know, a lot of this has been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know, if, if you look even specifically at some some of the lynchings that I did talk talk about, the circumstances were pretty darn similar, and I I, I, I think the reason why that that saying is so uh, poignant is the fact that people don't change. <laughs> I, I mean, our phones change, our computers change, but man, you know, our our stubborn nature doesn't really change, and there, there's not a whole lot of difference between between us today and uh, us, you know, twenty. I'm sorry, two hundred years ago. So, so walk us through the events that led up to the massacre of 1917 in Camp Logan, because, like I said earlier in the show, uh, a lot of us didn't know about the Tulsa Race Massacre until. The, we reached the 100 years back in June. Uh, so walk us through the events about the Houston riots. What happened? It seemed like from your book, it was something that happened overnight within a, a night's time span. So walk us through, because our viewers, some of us may, this may be the first time that we heard of the Houston riot of 1917. So walk us through the events. Yeah, so so the, the events involved members of the Buffalo Soldiers and most most of America knows knows of the Buffalo Soldiers. These were the the the, the, the black soldiers, uh, usually you know kind of in the West. They were cavalry. Often they were they were they, they had the uh, the cavalry hats on. So that's that's kind of the motif that that most Americans identify with, with the Buffalo Soldiers. So there were actually four four regiments. Two of them were cavalry. Two of them were infantry. And the book is actually actually involves. Uh, the 24th Infantry Regiment, one of the four, and they were actually they were actually stationed in New Mexico. But there was a battalion that was assigned to Camp Logan, which was in Houston, Texas. And what was going on is they were they were constructing constructing a uh, military training camp because of World War One. 
So they they sent these this battalion of troops there to basically act as the security guards while while the construction was 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 occurring. And that ended up being a really bad idea because Houston was not the right city. They were not in a place where they would welcome black soldiers. So there was there was some some bad forethought from the uh, army brass in sending the the soldiers there. Nevertheless, they did, and sure enough, there was trouble uh, almost from the get go. So th- so th- throughout the time that the soldiers were there, they were harassed by specifically the, the Houston policemen. But there, there was just a number of racial incidents um, that occurred with with you know the, the local population, streetcar personnel were particularly. Uh, egregious and contributed to the to to the events that came afterwards. Uh, needless to say, they were not welcomed. They were treated very badly. They were treated very dishonorably, considering that they were American servicemen. And this led to a flare-up. Then this led to you, what you might call mass hysteria, uh, a on mass mutiny against the army and eventual raid you you can essentially call it a military raid upon the city of houston where upwards of of, of more than a dozen whites were killed and and even some blacks were killed so that that, that was kind of kind of the, the the pretext of of the actual events themselves and interestingly enough unlike some of the other rights that we know of this this occurred basically over one night but the effects of it were, were significant. They were they were de- devastating. When I was reading your book, I thought that the book was, I thought that I was reading a novel because you were very descriptive about the events, what led up to it. And um, in your book, it's, so one of the things in your book, it's, it's, it's very grossly uh, depictive. Are you glorifying violence or what is the motive in terms of why you were very descriptive? Very descriptive like that. that that's a very good question. I think uh, obviously all art is interpreted through the eyes of the artist, right? So, I mean, if you want to call this art in written format, sure. I, 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 I certainly accept that, that description. And I have found that the most moving art is brutally honest, mm. right? You look at some of the photos of the civil rights area, right? You see dogs attacking young black men, right? It, it's horrifying stuff, uh, but it's very poignant. And I, and I, and, I, I and, and obviously we are, as a society are better because of this in your face depictions of very important historical events and I incorporate incorporate that attitude into my writing. I, I don't I don't pull punches. I want people to, to to experience. I want people to be uncomfortable, right? And I think that's what separates me from maybe some other authors is that some people would would opt to to to, to use metaphor or to to soft pedal some of the more disturbing parts of history and disturbing incidents. I, I don't do that. I don't do that. I, I certainly want people to be uncomfortable, to be uneasy. Um, because reality is is uneasy, reality is uncomfortable, and facts are very, uh, uh, very difficult things, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So yeah, if people are shocked a little bit, so and 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 taken back and and uncomfortable, then I think I've done a good job as 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 a writer, as a journalist, um, provocateur, um, and arguably as an artist. Yeah. It, it- Listen, your book is, is phenomenal. And, and for those uh, that want to see a copy of, of, of what the book looks like, let me pull a book up just really quickly. Uh, this is this is what his, his book looks like, Mutiny of Rage, the 1917 Camp Logan uh, Riots and Buffalo Soldiers. Listen, uh, Hame, one of the things that I thought was very interesting, you told a lot of stories in your book. Uh, you told a lot of stories in your book. And one, one of the stories that really bothered me in such a way to where um, I felt that it was worth mentioning. You talked about um, Tampa, Florida, and you talked about Buffalo soldiers who were stationed near Tampa, Florida, and troops from Ohio National Guard used a two-year-old black child as a target practice, and the mother had 
no other choice but to watch hysterically and she was unable to intervene the child got injured but was not killed and in response the buffalo soldiers uh, rampaged the city but nobody died and it sounds like that the buffalo soldiers you know as we are unraveling who they were it sounded like that they were a group that was very unapologetic about defending people of color specifically african americans what's your take what's your take on that part yeah i i i agree with you i and i was i was just as shocked when i uncovered that that incident and uh, obviously my response is is this is absolutely insane I, i i mean this was so egregious it almost it, it was hard to really kind of kind of process that people could do this and and moreover that that trained soldiers who who were held to a higher ethical standard could have could have done something like this the importance of that event was the fact that it it gave the reader and it, and of course at that time it conditioned the soldiers to expect that when they're put in those situations, they, they, they may very well snap, right? You can only, you can only push a soldier so far before he, he, he responds in, in, in that sort of a way. So that, that, that set the tone for things that happened later. The, 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 the riots in Houston, they didn't, they didn't happen in a vacuum. All right. They didn't happen on the spur of a moment. There were things that were leading up to this. And obviously using a child, a, a young, a young two-year-old toddler as, as target practice, that certainly set the tone for things that happened later on. Things were building up, obviously. And that certainly would have infuriated. It would have enra- enraged any, any sane person. And the, and the fact that, that it doesn't, it doesn't sound like, like a lot of, uh, a lot of restorative justice was was taken after that event. That would have certainly planted the seed for 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 bad things to come. Um, let me ask you this. Um, so your book, your story, the book that you wrote, what I got out of it was it was a story of police brutality, right? It was a story. That's what I. That's one of the things I got out of it. It was a story of police brutality, abuse of power, as we see when we get to you know chapter five, right? You detail the story of how the riot started. Black men, you know, uh, you see black men playing, uh, black men, young teenagers playing dice. These two vicious racist cops were called to investigate black teens playing, allegedly gambling. Uh, It was unsure if money was involved. And I'm reminded of how black men and women today are mishandled by police and abuse of power is taking place. And it seems like that this is not something that's just isolated to 2020 with George Floyd and, and Sandra Bland, but this is a history of police brutality and abuse of power in, the America. Power in America. Certainly, certainly. I mean, it, it gets back to what we just talked about. You know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure as hell rhymes. And the attitudes of, of the police 100 years ago, you could argue in many instances haven't changed much right you have a petty something that was that was arguably a very petty activity and then the police came down with a very very heavy heavy hands uh it it, it would obviously enrage anybody i mean i've <laughs> i i can't think of anybody of any color who hasn't been pulled over by, by the police and they felt that that injustice right that 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 rage you feel when when there's an abuse of power and especially when it's when it's directed towards you so it, it, it's easy to look, look, look back, or to uh, to look look at that situ- that particular situation as someone who hasn't experienced that and and dismiss it. But it, it's it's certainly one that that enrages people in ways that are unpredictable. Mm-hmm. With you, certainly on that point. So, okay, let me ask you this question. And I think it's very, it's very interesting and it ties a lot of things together. So um, you're a lawyer, right? You're a lawyer. And um, this book makes me think of one issue that is very debated between Democrats and Republicans, uh, the issue of critical race theory, 
What are your thoughts on critical race theory today and why is there so much tension between Democrats and Republicans on the issue? And do you see or did you see in your research to write this book, Critical Race Theory, playing out in the events that the unfolded? Events that unfolded. That, that's a good question. I, I think one of the reasons why critical race theory is, is such an incendiary topic is because it's very difficult to define what exactly critical race theory is. Now, I know for a fact that this 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 was the, the, for for most for most of its its existence, it's really kind of been relegated to uh, to to master's level courses. Uh, lawyers, some 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 law schools teach it as well. It's very difficult to to to, to define it that way. Now. According to some definitions, it seems like a very, very reasonable approach. You're, you're essentially look, looking at, at, at events. You're looking at history through the lens of, 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 of a racial perspective. And that, that's reasonable to most people. Um, the real debate really comes in is, is when that's politicized, right? When, when, when that particular approach, when that particular academic approach is used as a weapon or as a, a, a cudgel, in other words, to, to, to get your, your political me- aims resolved that's when you, you you start to see the the, the controversies so i think in the very in the very least i think the, the resolution to to the to the the controversy could begin with discussing what exactly critical race theory is and then from there we can have a discussion on 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 what's acceptable and what's what's reasonable um, um, were you able were you to able relate to, to relate, relate to this story, to this because, story of because of your time in the military, in the military? I was, I was, and, and 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 yeah, certainly my experience in the military really helped me because because I I could I could really kind of get into the the, the shoes of these men, and I even uh, in in some instances I, I I compared the situation that these men were in to the unit that I was in, and it, it, some of the motivations, the attitudes towards towards the servicemen, and really just kind of the everyday plight, you know, the, the trudgery, the the foot slogging of a of a of an infantry infantryman really gave me a perspective, and really allowed me to relate to to these to these soldiers and how they behaved, so forth. It, it's very interesting because I mean I I think, you know, since the days of the Roman legions, the the spirit of of, of the foot soldier hasn't really changed a whole lot, and and you you see that, obviously, with the, with the black soldiers and the non-black soldiers. The, the spirit and the attitude is, is pretty similar. And I'm, I'm certainly glad that I was able to, 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 to catch the nuances based upon my personal experiences as well and, and give it a certain richness and, and relevancy. So we all know, like I, I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we, back in June, we crossed the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And a lot of people did not know about Tulsa whether you live if you lived in Tulsa if you uh if you took any kind of history courses a lot of people didn't know the Tulsa race massacre existed because uh the events were suppressed for so long they didn't want it taught in schools they didn't like people talking about it in their neighborhoods and amongst their families and or what have you um was that the same case with the Houston riots of 1917 was it suppressed um, and also, what kind of research did you have to do to, to compile this book to get what you need to write this book? Yeah, that's a good question. And the answer is, is somewhat complicated, and perhaps even a little bit a little bit depressing. I, I would certainly agree with you that that a lot of that race riots, you could even go back to slave revolts, are, are, are nothing new. These these happened with with regular uh, occurrence uh, throughout time. Some of them, some of them, obviously, you know, the founding of Haiti was was based upon a slave revolt. Uh, that's probably one of the one of the more major ones that we learn about. Uh, but the but the ones that occurred on American soil, you're absolutely right, are are not well known. I have kind of considered myself to be a well well read person throughout my life, but. It was it was only when I went to Tulsa on business in, in something like two thousand and three that I heard oh there were the, by the way there was this huge race riot that occurred here and I 
had no idea. I was like, well, you know, I didn't even know that, that there were <laughs> a, a significant number of black folks in Tulsa mm-hmm. for, for there to be any kind of any kind of a race riot. So, yeah, I, w- I was absolutely surprised by this. And, 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 but thank, thankfully, in, in the spirit of the positive aspects of the, 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 this new racial consciousness, consciousness that we're, we're going through today, you, you are hearing more about these types of things. Now, in, in terms of Tulsa, that's a pretty straightforward response that, yes, we should know more about this. And people are. It's becoming more more public. Uh, President Biden publicly announced announced the fact that this that we, we were celebrating or I, or I should say noting the 100 year anniversary of, of this occurring. That was obviously a positive step. Now, Houston, I think, was a little bit different. There, there was a little more nuance there. And th- this is the the dicey part of it here in Houston, not a whole lot of people know about it. Right. Uh, e- e- even, even myself, it took me many years to, to, to really confront the facts of this incident. You know, before then, I think most people kind of heard that something happened in what we now know as Memorial park. Apparently that, you know, there was some, some black troops and people were killed. That's really about it. It's just kind of a, kind of a rumor, something that's, that, that's in the back of our mind. No one really knows what happened. And unfortunately, I, 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 I my theory, and this, this is, this is certainly going to be a controversial one is my theory is that both sides would in many ways would, would prefer this goes away. And, and one of the reasons I think is because there isn't one particular side that comes off looking white as a dove. There was, there was, <laughs> there was some bad stuff that happened on both sides. So in, in some ways it, it's plausible that, that the consciousness of the, uh, of, of the whites and the consciousness of consciousness of the blacks throughout time, I said, listen, if you don't talk about this, we won't. And we'll just kind of pretend this never happened. So I think, unfortunately, that's a lot of, of the the zeitgeist around this and that was obviously one of the one of the reasons why i thought this is a juicy topic to write about and this 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 you know if i could blow the lid so to speak on this on this uh, silence then great that's certainly what, what what i'm hoping to do one of the interesting things that uh, i read was with the young men, the young teenagers who were uh, being investigated, eventually chased because it was alleged they were playing dice and one of the officers um, chased him into a woman's house. This is all in your book. This is kind of how it, how everything you know leads up to the Houston riots. Uh, we read about Miss Travers uh, where one of the, the police officers goes in and, and pretty much violates his sacred duties and and abuses his power drags her out the house and you wrote in your book you said that that there were people watching and heard the commotion and they stood helplessly in fear and we can imply that they had fear because they feared that if they jumped in to help this black woman or this woman um that they too could be the victim of police brutality and or ultimately lose their lives. It made me think about the George Floyd murder and how, I don't know if you watched the trial, but it made me think about the witnesses who took the stand and and the things that they were saying on the live videotapes. And I think one of the witnesses was saying that they regretted not jumping in, but you could clearly hear in their voices that they feared even trying to intervene because they knew that something was going to happen to them and and something rose up in me to the point to where i started to think there may come a time to where people of color and or just anybody who's watching police brutality or watching god forbid another george floyd incident I feel like there's going to come a time to when people are actually going to step in and go toe to toe with law enforcement when it's clear that they're they are abusing their powers. Do you think that there's going to come a time to where we're going to see people intervening in law enforcement interactions with civilians that are going left that are going left field? I, I I think we'll see more of that, unfortunately, and I, I I think it's for the reasons that you just you just mentioned. 
every time something like that happens, you do get people questioning themselves, questioning whether whether passivity actually enabled this evil to occur. And what happens is they is that people vow that this sort of thing will never happen again. And, and unfortunately, what 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 that emboldens people to do is to potentially take the law into their own hands. So in other words, because 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 the police might not be transparent in the the idea that they are arresting a bad guy because he did certain things and therefore he should be shoved into a police car. People are going to get the wrong message and and they will, so to speak, try to enact their own form of justice. So, yeah, clearly communications is is, is the key there. And if you if you if you have police officers or officers who don't care about the optics, in other words, they don't care about how their actions are perceived, whether right or wrong. If they don't care how their their actions are perceived, you they will be planting the seeds of their own demise. And that's that's certainly one of the lessons that we learned, hopefully from this book, and 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 one certainly that people in positions of power can can hopefully implement in terms of public policy and, and procedure. So you and I were talking before we went live, and you were telling me that your parents are from Mexico, and you and so pretty much, uh, is it appropriate for a Latino to be writing about a chapter of American history between blacks and whites? <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's a really good question. And I, obviously my answer is 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 no. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I mean, yeah, obviously, yeah. I, I, I think that was I, I, actually one of the things that drew me towards this project was the idea that I was neither black nor white. And it enabled me to to have a perspective that either blacks or whites might not have had if when they when they approached this project. And w one of the interesting things of of the book, and I, I mentioned it very briefly, is the fact that Houston was a hugely Hispanic city even at that time. Yet during the troubles. Latinos were largely forgotten. They, they they didn't really matter, and I think that was a that, that was unfortunate. And when we talk about race issues in America, I still, in some ways, I still feel that Latinos don't matter, and that's unfortunate because obviously the the numbers don't 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 are 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 apparent. Uh, that they they are they have a significant weight in terms of uh, in terms of population and in, in terms of of voting and also in terms of uh, racial animus. So yeah, as applied towards towards the book, it it gave me a, a very interesting interesting perspective. And also, in many times, I was equally stern with with the actions of the soldiers. And the actions of, of, of the police, so it, it gave me a little bit of freedom to to kind of rack the knuckles of, of both parties when they needed to be, and really give give a uh, hopefully an unbiased account of of what happened, and 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 at the same time, acting many in many ways as an observer, as the Latinos at that time would have been to the madness going on, you know, what, what, what's, what, what, what the hell is happening between the, the, the white police and the, the black uh, population in Houston, yeah. right? Just kind of sitting back and, and seeing this unwind. So I, I, I'm glad it was, it was certainly a privilege uh, that I was able, able to do this. And hopefully, hopefully the, the, the both the black community and and uh, the law enforcement community would 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 read my book and say okay you, you, you did a good job that's that's my goal mm. uh, what is what is done what is what is being done in texas in terms of telling this story are there other organizations are there museums are there um, groups of people who are trying to tell this story like yourself and how many books are currently written about the Houston riots of 1917? There aren't a lot of books on this topic. And I, I, I 
in some ways that was a good thing for me. Obviously, I had a lot, there was a lot of fresh material that I could talk about in my book, and and obviously in some ways that was a bad thing because I didn't have a lot of stuff to go to fall back on to reference, to to research and to study. I will say that in terms, in my opinion, there was there was one serious book written about this, and that and that was written in the in the seventies. Uh, Professor Haynes, obviously, his book A Night of Violence was. A, a, an excellent resource for the minutia of the the events that that I, that I wrote wrote about. Uh, obviously, it's not an easy read. He took a very very academic approach to this. So, uh, to the casual reader, this this isn't you know <laughs> gripping stuff that 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 that's going to win literary prizes. But from a research perspective and in a, in a historical perspective, he did an e excellent job. That that that's one book that obviously comes to mind, and I and I, I use a lot of his his material for my project. A few other works written by some 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 black professors exist. Some smaller volumes on this, um, but not a lot of dedicated works existed on the Houston the Houston Mutiny. Obviously. The, a lot of the material that I that I that I researched was embedded in books about the Buffalo Soldiers as a whole, right? There they, they, they could, could have been a chapter or a, few, or a few pages on you know the incidents in Houston, and I gleaned a lot of that. Um, aside from my actual published books, there is uh, there were there there was a lot of media coverage throughout the years throughout the past decade or so. Um, newspapers in Houston, the, the Chronicle, most notably, have revisited this. A local news station did a pretty good uh, piece, a pretty pretty good docu document uh, documentary on on the events, which you can find on YouTube. It's very, it was pretty pretty well done. That has a lot a lot of information, um, and obviously going back in the archives, the actual media archives that that it, that that were written after those events that that proved extremely helpful so yeah it, it was a real kind of a kind of putting 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 together a puzzle from sources that 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 were not complete by any means but but painting a picture as best as i could from a whole lot of different sources it was it was, it was a definitely a labor of love and what's being done, uh, well, I really want to know this one, is there anything being done, like have you reached out to different organizations to spread the word about your book that are taking it to spread the message and or awareness about what happened? Yeah, th thankfully some organi organizations have been very receptive to the book. And... Uh, I, I don't hesitate to say that the actual actually the Black Lives Matter chapter of Houston has has showed some interest and hopefully I'll I'll I'll, I'll be collaborating with them um, in one way or or, an, or another perhaps giving a talk or perhaps having a conversation the same way you and I have been. Um, the Dallas Morning News did a piece on 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 this very recently just a few weeks ago. I I did a, I did a. a a, uh, a a a sit down and talk event with the Allen Public Library, which is basically a suburb of Dallas. They did they did a piece on me, and they should have uh, that conversation up uh, real soon. Those were very uh, very cathartic events that really kind of illuminated the book. Now, having said that. Having said that, I, I I have been surprised at some of the lack of interest from some of the some of the local Houston new, news outlets, and um, some of the black organizations here. I, I'm not quite sure, but yeah, but, but, yeah, but, but for instance, say the, the the Buffalo Soldiers Museum here hasn't shown a whole lot of interest. I'm not sure if if if, if my communications have, have have even gotten through to those folks. Um, but yeah, not not all black organizations in Houston have been receptive, at least not yet, but hopefully that that will certainly change. And um, obviously there, there could be things that I'm not seeing that are that are sort of going on in the background, but yeah, I, I think time will tell. We're working on that and and voices like yourself, 
I think are, are critical and and obviously you're, you're 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 doing God's work so to speak by by making this known well that's the power of black media you know we have the power and the opportunity and the platforms to tell our own narratives and to talk about the things that matter to us and clearly this is one of the things that matters to me as i am an african-american man <laughs> living in america living the black experience and living this thing called the black life um and uh, so another thing there were a lot of you know as a preacher this did stand out to me there were a lot of biblical references in your book was that intentional oh, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> and you know and, and and that's a really good question because look i am doing nothing different than herman melville all right when he wrote about moby dick uh john steinbeck who wrote about the grapes of wrath and, and what's funny about some of these great classical authors is is they were they, they were they weren't even marginally christian but but they certainly knew their Bible, and they and they used that to great effect to to produce some of the great works of literature. I I'm following in their footsteps. I'm standing on the shoulder of giants. But I I, I think to I think back to a particular particularly interesting quote, which I included in the book by Martin Luther King, and he basically says, "Look, you may consider me a civil rights leader, but I'm firstly and foremost a preacher. I, I am here to evangelize and talk about the good news. You know, the civil rights part is just sort of tangential, but I thought that was a very, very, very powerful and telling message that he sent. And in, in, in the same way, this book, I happen to be a practicing Catholic, so th this, this kind of lives inside me, and this is not an intellectual exercise. This is something that I, I, I try to live out. And it obviously comes out in the pages of, of the book that I wrote. So, you know, in some ways it, it's always kind of in the background, but it, it, it shows itself in little bursts of color throughout the book. And that works in my view because it doves ta dovetails also in what is essentially a, a spiritual story. You know, I, I, I think all struggles and all, all great forms of literature are based upon spiritual struggles of the protagonist. Mm -hmm. in, in this case, you, you have what was, what was essentially a biblical story that's been retold thousands of times. You have men who sinned. Now, we talk about why do they sin, right? We talk about redemption. And obviously, these these were these were these were deeply religious men. You know, I I, I try to color the the richness of their the, of what was probably their Baptist or Methodist faith throughout the pages of, of the book, but that certainly colored their thinking. It certainly colored some of the actions that that they that they part partook partook of, and it's not something that should be relegated as a as as a detail of history there was <laughs> you know it, it, speaking as a preacher I'm, which i'm not the spirit was moving throughout all of their activities and sometimes it the the, the, the spirit worked and motivated them to do the right thing and sometimes Sadly, it wasn't enough, and, and we did see some evil committed. But in, in a whole, someone like yourself, who, who, who is informed on things theological and spiritual, you, you, you might actually notice that this is, this is kind of a, a, a religious book. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? Don't tell anyone, but yeah, if you, if you found that this is, this is actually kind of a religious book disguised as a historical narrative, uh, I would say, wow, you've done your homework. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this. Um, how has your legal background helped you to put this book together? Yeah, it, it, I, it, certainly, it, it certainly was extremely helpful because the book, there's almost arguably two books or three books within my book. You have obviously the, the retelling of the of what happened, the accounts 
uh, you know, what, what happened before, what led to the, the, the mutiny and the rioting. Um, and then, in, then kind of in the second half, you have a legal thriller, a courtroom thriller of what is going to happen to these men, what is going to be their fate, and how is this going to be, going to be played out in a very complex, convoluted legal slash military justice system. Uh, and, and, and obviously, to, to pull that off, you really have to be exceptionally prepared and, and exceptionally researched, or, or you need to have come in there with the legal background, which I did, and that certainly helped. So in, ter in, in terms of how this, the book was written, you know, I, 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 I've said this before, it was kind of written in, in the form of a legal brief, all right? So obviously a legal brief is something that you would present to a judge. That's gotta be very crisp, it's gotta be very clear. The judge can skim it very quickly and say, okay, I know exactly what you are bringing before me, and I'll see if I can make a decision upon that. So, so in terms of the the uh, the, uh, the composition of the book, yes, my legal background certainly helped. But also in terms of the research, because the the majority of the material on this is is of a legal nature. These are basically court transcripts. Uh, these are these are legal briefs, motions, and so forth. Stuff that's a hundred years old, and stuff that you really have to know exactly what you're looking for. You need to know where to look and so forth, uh, you, you need to determine the relevancy of it. And thankfully, the research background that, that, that every law student is, is, is tutored on really comes in handy in, in, in terms of this sort of work. So yeah, yeah, there's no question about it. Um, hopefully, my, obviously my goal was that I, I, I made the legalistic part of that accessible. Right, I didn't weigh the reader down with minutia or legalese or so forth. Hopefully, I I, I I was able to distill somewhat complex legal 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 concepts into something that that the average reader can understand and appreciate. What happened to the bodies of these thirteen soldiers? Do we know what they are? Are they in unmarked graves, or what? What was the outcome? What was the of outcome? That? Yeah, they were originally buried very close by to where they were hung. And that was in San Antonio. They were buried there very shortly after they were, they were hung. You could say that they were, they were, it was kind of a hasty ritual. They were, they were put into coffins. There was a, a soda bottle with their name and rank and so forth in there. And they were, they were, they were interned. And it was actually, Many years later, that the camp was was being renovated, and they needed the, the, the those particular grounds for various military activities. So the bodies were actually moved, and they were eventually placed into a a, a, a national uh, military cemetery. That's that's eventually where they, where they rested. Yeah, and there was there was obviously obviously a lot. A lot of sort of obstacles and and details and and snafus and unexpected circumstances in between there, um, but yeah, thankfully they've 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 received the uh, for the most part honor honorable treatment. Um, and and of course, let's not forget that there is a there is a cemetery here in Houston, very very close to where where the events happen. That some of these these soldiers are are buried, uh, sar for sergeant uh, uh, of the book, Henry, for sergeant Henry is is buried there. Um, and this is kind of a a old historical cemetery for uh, predominantly for, for for African Americans, and some of the guys that participated in the riots are are there now, so there's. Different locations, yeah, for most of the men. What's one thing that you would want readers to get from your book? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, could you? I said, uh, what's one thing that you want readers to get from your book? Yeah, I, I, I would, I would hope that they would just have a better understanding of the of the of the human spirit. To be to be very honest, to to. Uh, understand what was going through the, these the, the minds of these men 
and what led them to do things that they, they didn't want to do or things that they regretted. Obviously. Because, because the more empathy we can have as a, as a society, the better. Arguably, you could say that, that the, all the, the events of this mutiny were caused because of a complete lack of empathy by, by some of these rogue policemen. So going back and, and, and seeing what could have been, been done, done differently, obviously, is, is the intent that I wish to, 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 to bring about from this book. And, and in this journey, if they can perhaps appreciate the, the religious undertones of, of this and, and the parallels that, that these men underwent, that would certainly be, be a satisfying <laughs> goal that I had when I, when I wrote this book. So do you think that your book is ready to be put on the big screen as a feature film? as a movie and who would you get to direct it? <laughs> this might come to a surprise, but I would pick Quentin Tarantino. And the reason being is that his style of filmmaking is All really is is Django when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I, I, I think even, even African Americans would agree that he's done some interest. He's made some very interesting works that are African American themed. And, the reason why I think he, he can appeal to, to all different sides of uh, uh, of the zeitgeist is the fact that he he's, he's known to to push the buttons. He's known to push push the limits. He's no known, known to be borderline inappropriate and offensive with all the the characters that 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 he he shows on the screen. So his his approach towards towards African American stories has been interesting, to say the least. He's he's a very talented guy, but I think his 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 ability to shock viewers, and we obviously you, you and I talked about this early early on in the interview. His ability to shock is one of the reasons why his his work is so entertaining, because he he exposes truths in a way that that make us kind of cringe and make us a little bit a little bit uncomfortable. But at the same time, we're, people are walking out of the theater thinking, wow what kind of a journey would, did I just go on? I think the material of this book, the fact that you have these men who are just, just, just messed with, they were harassed to the point where they finally snapped and then all hell breaks loose. We, we had hell on earth over the course of an evening. That's certainly the ripe and the right kind of material for a filmmaker like, like Tarantino to take and run with and, and provide and, and make something that's, uh, uh, probably even more jarring than my book. So I think, I, you know, one example I kind of think of is is people argue that Stanley Kubrick took took Stephen King's book, The Shining, and actually made, improved upon it by making a film. So that's kind of kind of one of the one of the rare instances where the the movie was better than the book. So with a bit of luck, we might have something similar to that. Yeah, but you know, Quentin Tarantino, don't you think that? Because this is a, a story about African Americans and the plight of African Americans and an actual true story, don't you think that you would get some pushback from the African American community for choosing somebody like Quentin Tarantino to 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 uh, direct this film? Because I think, you know, speaking for African Americans, we have we have people who could tell our story and direct it. Uh, we have people like Spike Lee, Ava DuVernay. Um, would you, would you, would you, would you be aware that you might get pushback for choosing somebody like Quentin Somebody Tarantino? like Quentin Tarantino. Oh yeah, certainly. Certainly. I mean, and I would expect it, but, but you, you, you actually, you actually do bring up a very good point. And, and, and there are very, very talented African-American directors. You know, I grew up with Spike Lee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, really? and you know, I, and, and it's funny because you know one of the first films I of, of his that I watched was Do the Right Thing, which, not surprisingly, kind of rhymes with Mutant and Rage. You know, you you had mayhem and and melee break out on the hottest day of the summer, right? So these these themes these, these themes are not You're right, right? <laughs> not unique by any means, but some of the up and coming f black film directors, um, you know, that, that we're talking about and some, some of the really, really entertaining 
black themed films, you know, like Get Out and so forth, which kind of kind of caught caught so American society by surprise in in a, in a extremely positive way. Wow. I mean, there, there's a whole lot of talent to choose from. So, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, if any of these great, great black directors looked at my book for, for a movie, I mean, wow, I, that, would, that would certainly be an honor by, by, by all means. So tell us one last question. What's, what's next for Hame uh, Shalza? Because even though you're a lawyer, you're an engineer, I feel like you are a writer where you love to tell stories. But what do you have next on your agenda to, to do? What, what do you what's your next work what are you doing next yeah that's a really good question i have i i have no idea myself but there are things that i'm kicking around the real challenge for me obviously is is finding that story right talking to people who 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 can provide me with something compelling to write about you know, it, it it's kicking, uh, kicking, kicking in doors, right? Investigating, uh, asking, being nosy, right? <laughs> asking questions, right? Getting people to 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 open up, and and it, it's it's actually more difficult than than it sounds because there were a couple of projects that I wanted to pursue, and I had the right people in place, and they got to a point where they just they didn't really want to talk about it, right? Um, I will I will say that 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 my, the genre that I that I think I'm most that's most appropriate to me my interest and my skill set is, is uh, obviously it's nonfiction right <laughs> maybe I'm a lousy liar but I'm not not good at making up stories right I'm much better at writing about things that are, things that occurred things that are real things that obviously people ex on this earth experienced so nonfiction is definitely my uh, the, the the genre that I'm most comfortable with obviously historical slash military is something that i'm interested in and arguably good at so it'll be along those lines and um you know when, when the right story comes around um hopefully i'll be in a position where i can uh gather up enough information to, to try, write a story about it and uh be able to 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 retell it now, interestingly enough, you know, world events right now, I, I actually even even as of this day are, are changing and are compelling. There's just uh, unfortunately not not a lot of good stories coming out of, of global events. But, you know, one, one of one of the uh, the only good points about that is that you, you have people like myself who are who are going to be eager to tell those stories to 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 bring to light these events and these uh, these, these struggles and these, these personalities. So we'll see, we'll see. I, uh, you know, as soon as I submitted the book, I mean, I was ready to rock and roll and see what, what new thing I can, I can write about. And, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I like to keep on moving. I like to stay busy. And, um, I, I, I really, I really appreciate the fact that you, uh, I, I think you, you characterize me very correctly. I, I'm a storyteller. I, I, I think at heart, that's yeah. really what, I, what, what drives me. Obviously, I'm many things, you know, I'm an engineer and and a lawyer, but, you know, storytelling is really, really what, what motivates me and what, what gets me gets me to wake up in the morning and, and, and enjoy life and keep keep the struggle up. So, yeah, <laughs> that gets back to to me really thanking you for having me on your show and, and being able to to talk about this. Well, there you have it. Huh? Listen, do me a favor, Hame. Tell us uh, where we could find your book, follow you on social media, all that wonderful stuff. I have your social media handles. I'll put them up. Just tell us where you can find them. Where we can find you. Where we can find you. Yeah. Uh, if you want to buy the book, I've, I've got a whole bunch in my, in my house. All right. And, and hey, they are, they're, they're selling like hotcakes. If you want to sign one, give me a shout. I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, if you just want the book, so to speak, a a Amazon has been, has, has been great. You can get it in all the major outlets. You know, I was I was actually actually surprised to see that Walmart is has got it on their website. So you can't go wrong with that. And I will say that uh, it is in Barnes and Noble bookstore because I was able to pick it up myself at Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble.
okay, wow, okay, that I, I didn't know because I, I, I was curious enough to, to, to shop around, look around for it here in Houston, but I thought obviously they're going to have it in Houston. But to say that they've got it in, at your Barnes & Noble, wow, that's, that's a huge compliment. So <laughs> that's really nice to hear. Yeah. Uh, and real quick, the uh, I, I've got I've got my own website as an author, legionofthelost.com. Um, obviously, that's named after my first book, which was which was not related to the, to, to the Houston riots. But there are links in there on the books the the other books that I've written, including Mutiny of Rage. Th there's material there. You can contact me there. I'm on Facebook, uh, Instagram. And uh, yeah, I've got my email addresses there as well. If anyone wants to wants to uh, to have me come by and, and make a presentation in in any uh, sort of a aspect, uh, I'd be happy to do that, to do that as well. So I hope to hear from from all your all your. All right. Well, there you have it. Get his book, uh, "Mutiny of Rage: The 1917 Camp Logan Riots and Buffalo Soldiers in Houston." Uh, get his book. I have it. Like I said, I was able to go to Barnes and Noble and pick it up. It's a, a great read. I was able to go through it. It's very telling. It's a page turner and it would definitely tell you the story about what happened in Houston back in 1917, uh, a couple of years shy before the Tulsa race massacre. It's a very important story. We want to thank our guests. Also, y'all do me a favor. Listen, follow me on Twitter at Deontay J. Carroll right there. All one word, no apostrophe. Also, follow me on Instagram at Deontay Carroll, all one word, no apostrophe. You also want to follow me on YouTube at Deontay Carroll. Look for my logo. Uh, and also, make sure you like, tag, share, and subscribe. Go to YouTube right now and hit the subscribe button. But don't, don't just hit the subscribe button. Tap the bell and then hit all. So that way, anytime I post a video, anytime I post new content, you will definitely get the notification on all of your uh, electronic devices. And uh, so listen, also follow me on Facebook. I go live each and every week on Facebook Live at Deontay J. Carroll Sr. Listen, uh, also go to my website. Listen, check my website out, www.deontaycarroll.com. You can see some of my shows, my past shows that I've done, read more information about me, who I am, different links to things that we're doing here at Turn Up The Volume Podcast. And listen, I love you guys so much. I'm glad that y'all were able to tune in for another edition. We had some technical issues, but we're going to edit and work the kinks out, okay? Ain't no shame in the game here at Turn the Volume Podcast, okay? It is what it is. We living in the pandemic where everything is going virtual and we are ironing everything out. But anyway, listen, I say this each and every week. I'm yet again inspired by these uh, Buffalo soldiers because they got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And like I tell y'all every week before I end the show, there's a lot going on. Don't let nothing frustrate you. Whatever you got to say, do me a favor and say it with your chest. I'm Deontay Curl. I love you guys. Hame, don't go nowhere. Let me play my theme song, and we're going to chat a little bit after the show. Uh, so listen, y'all do me a favor. Be good. Have a good week, and I love y'all.